Hello and welcome. welcome. I'm Keith Fox, and welcome to the wrap-up of day four of a very exciting ESC Congress here in Paris. With me are three really important experts who've been chairing sessions and leading some of the project areas. So Gabriel Steg, uh, Sabine Ernst, and David Capodano. So uh, we're going to start, uh, Sabine, if I may, with you. Um, news is old news. So uh, ICDs and heart failure, yeah, so we, we, we know they worked. We know they worked, but we always wondered if the data that made us implant ICDs in, in patients with reduced ejection fractions was actually valid because the data or the, the recommendations are based on data that are about 20 years old. Right. Now, this morning we heard about the ICD use in heart failure trial that was actually, it's a reg registry days data registry, analysis yep. um, from the Swedish heart failure registry from the Karolinska Institute that showed that looking into the Swedish population and looking how many patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction would be eligible for ICD primary prevention implantation. And it turns out there are about 16,000 patients eligible. Interestingly, the analysis showed that about 10%, roughly 10% were actually implanted. So in a high income, very sophisticated country, 10% of those potentially eligible are implanted. Yeah, we have a problem. Is, that is quite interesting. Now, the, yes. the, the guidelines are pretty clear. They're actually not yes. so difficult. And nevertheless, um, that is the reality. And that's what I really liked about the data and looking Frankly, is that actually happening? What we believe um, is happening in the community, and, and the Swedish data predicted? also showed that it worked. There is a difference in the observational data in outcomes. Exactly. So what they did, they looked at about. You know, you could always argue there are easier patients and the older or younger patients, but but they looked in, and they performed a propensity match um, comparison, yeah. and they showed that um, in one year you have an all-cause mortality reduction of 26%. And if you continue to follow the patients, and it's still valid after five years that the patients who got an ICD implanted okay. actually did better. So and survived sustained longer. benefit. Sustained benefit, and basically the take-home message from that is yes, these old recommendations, you could say the old EC guideline recommendations still hold true. And Are they relevant today? They're relevant today, and the data is reproducible even now with all the adjunct therapy that we do for patients with reduced ejection fraction. So there's another analogous study, which is uh, a large French registry, uh, to validate uh, some of the information from Castle HF. Exactly. So here comes again the heart failure topic. Heart failure and arrhythmia go hand in hand, of course, and a lot of patients have heart failure. Now, um, the Castle AF study was a landmark study showing that catheter ablation can help these patients and, in, in fact, in, improve mortality. Now, the question also here was, is that reproducible? Is that not a very sophisticated, very highly selected cohort that was ablated by experts? Is that really true? And what the group from Tour did, um, they looked into, again, da big database of over 250,000 patients in France looking in who would be, who, who actually got an ablation, and the vast majority, of course, didn't get an ablation, only 0.5% actually got ablated. And those patients did better with regards to all-cause mortality and hospitalization, and it was actually, a, again, an eye-opener. They basically reproduced Castle AF, putting the argument that this was cherry-picking and only the easiest heart failure patients would benefit aside, which I think, again, is a very important message that heart failure patients and atrial fibrillation patients should at least be evaluated okay. uh, if they could be ablated or not. So, so very nice illustrations of how some real world data can augment and bring up to date some of the evidence that we had before. Exactly, and we need to validate it, of course, of because course. otherwise, you know, if we, and that's the beauty now of having these large cohorts that we can look into to really make the point of it's not only the experts that can do it, it's actually a, a very widely applicable result. Right. So let's move to some randomized trial data. And there's a uh, very interesting study from Australia, the uh, rapid TNT study using high sensitivity troponin and essentially testing a zero to one hour uh, strategy of getting a high sensitivity troponin in order to rule people out or direct their treatment. And uh, Gabriel, tell us about this. Well, this is a great uh, idea from Derek Chu and colleagues in Adelaide, Australia, where they actually they, not, they didn't specifically test the zero one-hour protocol, uh, 
They tested the implementation of the zero one hour protocol with high sensitivity troponin compared to the conventional zero to three hour protocol. And what they found, which I think is quite striking, is that um, this is uh, non-inferior in terms of safety of detecting the, uh, the proper MIs, that the rule out uh, patients actually have an extremely low event rate. So that's also interesting. So it can be implemented, it's safe, you're not sending uh, away patients. They, they spent less time in the emergency department and more of them went home. Exactly. So you, you save time, you uh, avoid unnecessary uh, uh, waiting in the, in the hospital and, and admissions. Now what's interesting is that with the high sensitivity troponin used for the zero one algorithm, they picked up more positive troponins that led to more investigations, that led to more PCI, that led to more myocardial injury. So I don't know how, as an interventional cardiologist, we should interpret that. I, I don't know whether David is thinks, but uh, I thought that was interesting. The, this was not the most emphasized part of no. the study, but I think it's interesting. But we really have to give credit to the Australian investigators for, in a randomized setting, testing the implementation of the study. And in fact, the discussant, uh, Dr. Müller from, uh, from Switzerland, who's really uh, one of the world luminaries on the issue, uh, credited the group with, with that. So I think it was a great study. So great study, but we still have work to do to know what, how to deal with yeah. myocardial injury yeah. and type 2 MI. And I will point out also that this study is already online in circulation. Okay. Now, uh, let's also talk a little bit about Entrust AF, because there have been studies with a number of the NOACs in terms of uh, AF uh, with a, a PCI procedure and how much and how long with the uh, antiplatelet agent. So this is, in a way, the fourth pivotal study, the fourth pivotal trial of direct oral anticoagulants, looking this time at adoxaban with antiplatelet therapy, uh, a P2Y12 inhibitor, stopping aspirin early after PCI compared to the conventional triple strategy based on vitamin K antagonist and DAPT. Uh, it's a little smaller than Augustus and Redual PCI, larger than Pioneer AF. Uh, the investigators did find that the uh, dual base strategy, the dual edoxaban based strategy uh, was non-inferior for uh, efficacy and was safer than the triple strategy with lower bleeding. Although there was initially lower bleeding with vitamin K antagonists, but they uh, were able to demonstrate that this was probably related to underdosing of vitamin K antagonist and low INR so in was, the first there, few days. They were days. actually subtherapeutic for the first seven days. Exactly. They were intratherapeutic first and then it bled less and then once they got to be therapeutic, edoxaban based strategy was better, although in all fairness the discussant, uh, Dr. Lopez, pointed out that it is difficult to tease out what is related to triple therapy versus dual therapy yeah. and what's related to DOAC versus vitamin K antagonist. But, but, but just picking up on the issue of the bleeding, looking at the study as a whole, not the post hoc landmark analysis, actually the difference between the 20% and the 25% was not significant. Exactly. Which I was surprised at because one arm is getting triple therapy. Yeah, so I think it's related to these two issues. It's a little smaller than the previous trial and early on there's an advantage in terms of bleeding for the vitamin K antagonist because it's unwillingly so, but it is uh, somewhat underdosed. Another uh, observation which is of interest and uh, uh, was pointed out by the investigators is that there's numerically a higher rate of thrombotic events early on, in particular stent thrombosis. And remember that this is a trial where aspirin was stopped very early after the procedure. Patients could be randomized to stopping aspirin within hours of PCI. And I think it's a welcome reminder that uh, procedures need to be done on aspirin. And if you stop aspirin, maybe we need a few days of aspirin before we discontinue. In previous trials, sometimes the duration could have been a little longer. Now, the investigators did what they uh, they were the only ones to be able to do, which is to pull the data from the four trials into a meta-analysis, and they do find a consistency there of a trend towards more thrombotic events early on when you stop aspirin. Okay, now let's move into... And uh, that is in the Lancet. Yes. So let's now move into popular genetics, if it is popular. Yes. And uh, is uh, the analysis of uh, CYP2C19 sufficient? So this is uh, also a very interesting study. Uh, we want to commend the Dutch investigators who did this academically-led, investigator-led uh, uh, trial. They asked the question, the, the, the conventional question of, can we get away avoiding to give prasugrel or ticagrel to everybody with the cost and bleeding attached to it? 
can we genotype patients and only use ticagrelor or prasugrel in those patients who are poor responders because they have the wrong genotype and use clopidogrel in the good responders and what are the results of this strategy so they took primary patient primary pci patients who had just undergone STEMI patients who had just undergone primary PCI, and they genotyped them on the spot. Point of care genotyping can be done in three hours. Three hours. And depending on the genotype, and they randomized them to act on the genotype or receive conventional treatment with ticagrelor. And uh, what they find, which is quite striking, is that there is lower bleeding and uh, at least as good efficacy, if not slightly numerically better, in the genotype-guided arm than in the conventional arm. Uh, so I think that's really very important and very intriguing. I'll point out a few things, and the discussant Marco Valjimigi made a number of remarks. Uh, first of all, this is the first of two trials exploring the same thing. There's another larger U.S. ongoing trial that's ongoing, and we'll see how these fare. The second thing is patients received uh, almost universally ticagrelor for the first 24 to 48 hours. So the primary PCI was actually done on ticagrelor, which tended, of course, to minimize differences between arms. And likewise, there was a, quite an, a sizable discontinuation rate in both assigned arms and some crossovers, which also were all put on the same therapy, which means that, again, the treatment arms tended to converge. Maybe that may have diluted somewhat the differences. That being said, I think it's very striking. It is not the first time we see that observation. And I think it's uh, certainly an interesting uh, observation for those sites and those countries where access or cost of newer agents are difficult. And it's also, it might be a way to try to minimize bleeding. Okay, uh, now they- um, And that the is in the New England Journal of uh -huh. Medicine. <laughs> You're plugging everything. So um, uh, they may actually have underestimated the impact of genotyping because they only me measured the yes. CIS2C19. They did not measure the uh, STAR17 gain of function alleles, which could have influenced and reduced the number that needed to be crossed over to aggressive treatment. Yeah, the discussion, Dr. Valjimigli appropriately pointed out several points. First, as you point out, they should have looked at the super responders. Yes. Might have been even better. And also the non-inferiority that they conclude on is largely based on the hypothesis that the event rates are gonna be between 16 and 18%, and they had a non-inferiority margin of 2% absolute. But what happened is, as, as is often the case, you plan a trial expecting 16% event rate, but your event rate is between 6 and 8%. And therefore, 2% of that observed event rate is very different compared to 2% of the expected event rate, and that might have been a bit of a generous margin. That being said, the genotype-guided arm actually fared better than the a conventional arm receiving the potent P2I12 agent. So I don't think, I think this is a technical point, but it's a little, bull, a little bit of a moot point in that so, instance. So uh, popular genetics is likely to get even more popular? I think it's going to be very popular, uh, particularly where access to Tacagal or Prasugrel is restricted. Sabine? I think the, the real thrill for me is that you can analyze it in three hours. In three hours, yeah. And that is really, I think that makes it so exciting because they so far that was something that we would get back months later. That's right, and, and they use two different never. platforms and, exactly. and managed to do yeah. it, which yeah. is very impressive. Right, now, David, you were chairing sessions uh, this morning. You've seen some large observa observational data. What are you going to pick out? So it was a session dedicated to prevention somehow, primary and secondary, with the lifestyle changes, with drugs, uh, with devices as well. So uh, I found very interesting uh, the Clarify registry. Gabriel is here, will correct me if I'm wrong, of course. This is uh, published in the European Art Journal with a lot of data. And uh, these are registries uh, at their best, I would say, because we need the data from the real world experiences that uh, somehow frame uh, what we learn from randomized clinical trial. And I found very uh, fascinating that they already align all the terminologies that uh, surround this registry with the new guidelines for the chronic coronary syndrome. And they showed beautifully that uh, there are so many situations beyond stable angina that uh, still qualify for the definition of uh, chronic coronary but syndrome. But having angina alone, Correct me if I'm wrong, having angina alone did not augment the mortality risk. That, that was uh, one of the important peaks of this But if you uh, had registry. a PIMI, obviously it did. Exactly. They found this important interaction between angina and prior MI, and a couple of major curves uh, speak uh, by themselves and shows that if you have angina on top of a prior MI, that is the identifiable, sizable cohort that you have to look more strictly. Yeah. Now, there's been a huge amount of information from PURE, 
not only in this uh, meeting but in previous ones. What do you think are the key messages from the presentations today? So there were two presentations. The first one uh, uh, refers to the population of uh, 160,000 uh, uh, people, and they looked specifically to the causes of that uh, according to the income of the country. So it was a somehow eye-opening uh, that in uh, high-income countries now cancer is paying its toll much more than cardiovascular mortality. That was, uh, to me, a kind of shift uh, in, uh, in the paradigm. But that's say. only in the high-income countries. Exactly, because in the others, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, still is the most prevalent uh, cause. And what I found also interesting is that uh, it's uh, much more likely that you will die in a low-income country of cardiovascular disease yes. than in a high-income And if they had an country. event, it was, the consequences were much worse. Exactly. While yeah. cancer has the same mortality in all countries, regardless of the income. Yeah. 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 That was one message. The other message uh, was uh, the one on the other paper that was also simultaneously published in uh, The Lancet. And uh, this is uh, really about the attributable uh, risk to uh, various factors uh, that are uh, behavioral, that are psychological. Pollution was also in investigated. And, uh, maybe for the first time so, in this kind of time. So, David, I have a question for you. We, we heard uh, earlier in this Congress from the Mendelian randomization studies that almost all the risk can be attributable to the double uh, uh, Mendelian randomization to high LDL and hypertension. And we've heard today from Pure that it's environmental. It Which is, is very it? interesting that uh, there are different uh, risks uh, according to the type of outcome. So if it is cardiovascular death, uh, then of course uh, risk factors, traditional ones, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia. But if it is mortality as a wall, then of course uh, pollution, uh, uh, grip, uh, uh, or uh, smoke, uh, this, and uh, education, which was yeah. a, a good message also. But I think the key message is that, you know, the genetic factors uh, are influenced by environmental factors, Definitely. and clearly there are uh, a number of ways that that, that can happen. So, uh, uh, Sabine, there's also been some interesting uh, debates in the past about Cabana and some insights from this meeting. Yeah, so the Cabana group um, published uh, the results and basically looked into the different types of atrial fibrillation patients. So paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients were compared with their outcomes to this composite endpoint of uh, all-cause mortality, death, hospitalization, and so on, and compared to paroxysmal, paroxysmal persistent and long-standing persistent. And interesting, as we know, it's, uh, for the composite endpoint, there is no difference, and that there, the lack of that difference is true for all three groups. But if you only look to mortality and hospitalization, the, there's a benefit for paroxysmal patients. There's essentially not much of a difference for persistent, but there is a negative benefit, so a, 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 hazard. a hazard for patients with long-standing persistent age fibrillation. And, and that, again, underlines the fact that we need to see patients early. We need to offer ablation early. The earlier, the better, the easier okay. uh, the patients to treat. Right. In a moment, I'm going to ask each of you an unfair question about what you think is the study that will have the largest impact from this Congress. But um, in the meantime, uh, Sabine, you know, there have been some very interesting devices. There was Apple Watch in the past, and now there are smart devices that can be attached to your smartphone to pick up AF. Yeah. So um, one of the most exciting publications, I think, in the recent weeks was the, the data from the Mayo Clinic showing that on 12 leak ECGs, they could detect atrial fibrillation, they could identify patients at risk of having atrial fibrillation from an ECG in sinus rhythm. In sinus rhythm. In sinus rhythm, which is amazing. Yep, now, yep. the data that has been presented here shows that from a single lead ECG that is connected via Bluetooth to a smartphone, yep. and then the investigators looked into, again, I think 41 million ECGs, a huge data set, and looked into that and did uh, some basically some machine learning algorithm, and I'm, I'm not an expert yet to explain how that yes. actually is done, but from, again, a single lead ECG, in sinus rhythm, they were able to predict atrial fibrillation and show the patient at risk for a high burden of atrial fibrillation. Yes. Actually, they differentiated high burden and low burden, even, yes. no which is amazing. No individual could do that. It's a machine learning algorithm, and I think that we have more to find out from that. So, uh, David, you've been thinking about what's the uh, study you want to highlight? 
Well, as an interventional cardiologist, I must uh, say complete, because complete. this will uh, affect my practice, because it means that uh, all patients have to be revascularized completely if they are STEMI with multivessel disease. But staged revascularization. Exactly. But uh, we like the options of uh, looking at ischemia after discharge. Of course, the small trials that were already there said the opposite, and we were uh, completely revascularizing before, but I think this closes the discussion. This has to be done. Gabriel? Well, uh, I would have said complete, but now it's been taken, so I will say DAP-IHF, and I think DAP-IHF shows a remarkable benefit in heart failure of SGLT2 inhibitors, but what really, why I think this is eye-opening, it's because it's working also in patients who don't have diabetes, yeah. and I think it's telling us a message. SGLT2 inhibitors are not anti-diabetic drugs, they're cardiovascular the drugs. Cardiovascular it's drugs. exactly as if we thought that ACE inhibitors are nephrology drugs just because they affect creatinine and yep, protect yep. the kidney. The reality is that ACE inhibitors are cardiovascular drugs, SGLT2 drugs, probably, we will see the next trials that are coming up, probably are cardiovascular protective drugs, and cardiologists need to know them very well. Absolutely. Sabine, you get the last word. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled for one combination, so actually two abstracts here presented, very, very small numbers so far, but what I really think what the future is for arrhythmia management, especially for ventricular arrhythmia, is to identify the substrate for ventricular arrhythmia by imaging, then combine this with non-invasive mapping, there are some technologies for that, and then not bringing the patient to the cath lab, but bringing the patient to our radiology um, oncologist colleagues and using their cyber knife um, ablation, basically, yes. tool. It's not an ablation tool, it's a, it's a radiation tool. A ra yeah. And modify the scar so that these patients don't have any more VTs. I think this is a, the, the dream of every, it everyone. It could be a revolution. It's a complete revolution, and, and cath labs go back to the interventionists, and we have more time um, <laughs> for uh, nicer things, maybe. Okay, terrific. I want to thank all three of you, to Gabriel, to Sabine, to David, for your really interesting insights, and uh, congratulations for all your parts in this exciting Congress, and thank you for listening.